Hello my friends, welcome back. So, I've got a bit of a different story for you guys today. It's called Tegau of the Golden Breast. It's a Celtic legend and it's set right here in this area of southwest England where I uh, grew up. Uh, now, this is part of uh, Arthurian legend. When we think of the knights of King Arthur and the Round Table and Lancelot, the image in our heads, most of us, probably stems from the sort of medieval, usually French courtly tradition and various later retellings in the 19th century, you know? So it's a story that's still evolving. But these stories are based on much earlier Celtic material, usually from the Welsh textual material, and that is usually based on even earlier oral tradition stretching way 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 back to the time when these stories are set which is usually the collapse of the roman empire before the saxons marauded their way east across this island and took over um what used to be called the dark ages this is king arthur's britain and in history uh britain splintered into lots and lots of little kingdoms where i am now uh, it was called the Kingdom of the Dubunni. And then just a little bit further west in Wales, it was the Kingdom of the Silures, the Atrobates were east of here. All these little Celtic kingdoms that were, after the Romans left, Romanized. So this is very much a story where myth and history intersect. And it takes place here, where I am. Now, I'm on the farm where I grew up now, and you may notice in my hand here is a piece of Roman tile. This is a 2,000 year old bit of building material that came out of the ground right there, about 10 meters away from me there. So this farm that I grew up on was an Iron Age Celtic encampment that the Romans took over and turned into a pottery. So the bricks and tiles made right here on the farm where I grew up, right there, they were fired there, they went on this Roman road that goes over these fields here to the nearby town of Sirencester, which if you are from the UK, you may have heard of. If you are from the US, you probably will not have, but in the Roman times, it was the second capital of Roman Britain. Londinium first, then Carinium, right here. And it was made right here. So I, in my hand, am holding a piece of the story I am about to tell you, which is uh, most of it is set in Carinium and the land south of it, which is right here. So here it goes. One day, a prince of Gwent, Gwent is in South Wales, a prince of Gwent named Caradog was on royal business in the city of Sirencester. Now, his business was concluded in the morning, so he was not due back at his father's palace until the next day, so he decided to take a stroll outside the city walls one afternoon. So he walked outside the Roman city walls, still intact, and took a little wander around the agricultural land until he came to a burial mound. It's still there, it's called Tar Barrow. Now the Romans left these barrows alone. They were associated with a, a much earlier people and they were usually inhabited by the others, the fairy folk, the she we may call them, people of the other side. So Caradog was approaching the tree line on this mound and he fancied in the gloaming, in the half light, because the sun was going down, he heard two voices conversing in a musical language that he did not understand. Curiosity got the better of him and he approached the forbidden fairy mound and there in a gap in the trees he saw a man and a woman conversing and as soon as he locked eyes with that woman and she locked eyes with him he fell head over heels in love with her. It was like magic and he fancied he saw some similar recognition of love in her eyes. But alas, 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 she was with another man who turned to look at Caradog and then turned and disappeared into the gloaming, back into that barrow, into the other world. The woman, on the other hand, 
beckoned him closer. It turned out that the other man was not her lover, but her brother, a man named Drion Apnud. <laughs> anyway, this woman of the other world, whose name was Tegal, and Prince Caradog of Gwent fell in love with each other. Each one recognised that the other was the soul they had spent their whole life, perhaps many lifetimes, searching for. And that very night, Tegel gave Caradog her love and her body, and the next day they were married! <laughs> so, Caradog left Sirencester the next day with his new wife and journeyed to the court of King Arthur at Camelot, or Kerlion in this story. <laughs> now, they were feasting, as often happens, they were making merry, and then at one point there was a knock on the door. This often happens in these old Arthurian tales. King Arthur and his knights are feasting, and then an intruder enters. Knock, 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 knock. The doors open, and a man enters, a tall man with a druidic tonsure. That means the top of his head is shaved, but long matted dreadlocks going down the back of his head, long matted dreadlock beard. He was wearing a cloak of green, and in his hands was a gold golden drinking horn and he strode into King Arthur's court and King Arthur said ah excellent some uh, interesting event entertain us visitor what have you got a challenge it's always a challenge <laughs> so this druid whose name was Elvira said I have in my hands a horn it cannot be drunk from by any man whose wife has been unfaithful in an act of word or thought or deed. <laughs> so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a testing horn to see if, uh, if a man is a cuckold or not. <laughs> well, Queen Guinevere and all the ladies of the court suddenly became very interested in their feet or the floor or the dog's ass or whatever it was. No one would look their husband or lover in the eye. <clears throat> Well, King Arthur tutted and looked around. He couldn't see his knights and uh, men of court be shamed by this silly, wandering druid that had just wandered in with his big horn. So um, King Arthur said, I will drink from the horn. And he put the horn to his lips and the wine went everywhere except his mouth. It splurted down his clothes. It went on his knees, it went on the floor. It dripped on his dog. Queen Guinevere, who had clearly been unfaithful indeed, body or mind, went bright red. King Arthur looked around at his knights and said, right, now everyone Every man here is going to try this horn. So all the knights, all the warriors of King Arthur's court tried this drinking horn of the druid one after the other and every single one couldn't even taste a drop. The wine went all over the place. The whole court was stuffed with cuckolds. Not a single woman was faithful until the, the horn finally went to um, Caradog himself and he drank and not a single drop was spilt. And Tegau put her arm, her hand on her new husband's knee and smiled at him. And she alone was faithful out of the whole court. <clears throat> a deathly silence fell upon the court. And Arthur piped up and said, well, at least one of us can hold our drink. And the spell was broken and everyone erupted into riotous applause. Uh, Arthur asked where um, his new bride, the young Tegau, was from and she answered for herself. She didn't say the other world, she just said Sirencester, Corinium, which is just a few miles that way. A fair city, a fair city, said King Arthur and one which will do well against the invading Saxon hordes, uh, but it needs a good uh, defender. It needs a good warrior put in charge of it. And this warrior will be you, Caradog. So, King Arthur gave the city of Corinium and all the lands southwards, that's right here, by the way, to uh, Caradog as a gift, as a reward for the faithfulness of his wife. Now, <clears throat> The feasting kind of commenced again and the whole hall descended into merriment and that druid just beckoned Caradog over for a private little word. 
and the druid in some corner of that hall of King Arthur spoke to Caradog and he said your wife is faithful now but give it a few years and her faithfulness might start to wane just like all the other knights of this court and Caradog said well, how dare you how dare you talk to me like that you druid I'm a prince of Gwent <laughs> And that druid said, I know exactly who you are because I am your father. What? said Caradog. My father is dying in his bed. <laughs> my mother is there too. You're not my father. And this druid, whose name was Alvira, said, Examine your feelings. He went all Darth Vader. You know it to be true. And somewhere in Caradog's heart, he knew, he knew that his whole life had in fact been a lie. And so soon after the joys of the marriage with his beloved and the trials of the drinking horn, he was dealt this fatal blow. The man he thought was his father was not his father. His father was this ragged, dark druid stood in front of him. It was clear he could recognize his own self looking back at him. Well. He did not even wait till the morning. He got on his horse and rode directly west to the lands of his father through the palace gates of the palace of Gwent. <clears throat> and he confronted his mother. He said, Mother, there's something you haven't told me. And he said, I met this bloody druid. He said, I was your dad. Tell me it's not true, Mum. Mum! I'm afraid it is true, my son. What? What the hell, Mum? said Caradog. Look, my son, your father was away fighting the Saxons. I was alone. He was an enchanter. What? That? La, 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 Don't tell me this. But she did. They got to arguing. How could you? You've betrayed. You've betrayed my father, the king. You're a traitor. Why couldn't you tell me this? My whole life has been a lie. Look, you petulant child. You stupid boy, she said, and she slapped him, spat in his face. I don't know what cruel, harsh words were spoken. Caradog was furious and in a rage he stormed into the royal chamber of his own father except it wasn't his father the king of D B Gwent who was bedridden dying old spit in his beard his eyes all misty and he spoke of the infidelity of his own mother to the king of Gwent I have to tell you it broke the old man's heart. He'd always suspected, he'd always suspected, but love had made him blind. But now he had been cuckolded, not just once, twice, but again and again and again by some druid from across the seas. With uh, his foster father's permission, this uh, young prince of Gwent, Caridog, uh, newly made monarch of Sirencester and the surrounding lands, took his mother back and imprisoned her in a tower above the old Roman city walls, above Silchester Gate. <clears throat> Maybe I'll put a little picture there because it was a little uh, sort of fortified tower. And you know, she had a nice, she had all her nice, you know, she had her clothes and combs and nice food, but she couldn't go or leave and was put under close guard by her own son. Let's just say there was a bit of discord in the family situation. Now, no one was permitted to come or go, but her lover, the druid, Elviras, had other ways and could sometimes change his form into, say, a crow or raven and fly through the small arrow slit window into the queen's cell and then turned into his human form and they commenced with the lovemaking, <clears throat> night after night after night. <clears throat> and there, <clears throat> lying coiled up in each other's arms and their smutty bedsheets in what was supposed to be a prison, they plotted how they were going to get their son under their power. Now, one day, <clears throat> Caradog, who was settling in nicely in his royal duties as the ruler of Sirencester and the surrounding lands, uh, he went to visit his mother 
in the tower. She may have been his prisoner, but she was still his mum, and he sometimes liked to bring her, I don't know, maybe some nice, uh, nice things to eat or something to read, I don't know, some magazines. Um, and on this very day, his beloved wife, Tegau, was visiting her brother in the burial mound, Tar Barrow, just outside the city walls. So, Caradog went in to see his mum and he found his mum in a terrible state. She was all dirty, her hair was uncombed and unwashed, grime under her fingernails. She hadn't changed her clothes or cleaned herself. And he said, Mum, what's up? It distresses my heart to see you like this. And she said, oh, my boy, what good is it doing myself up and making myself look presentable if no one here who loves me can see me? And he said, Mum, come on, comb your hair. Tell me, where is your comb? I'll get it for you. And she nodded towards a chest in the corner of the room. Caradog, her son, went over, reached into the chest, and ah, ah, on his hand was a snake. It had bit right onto his arm and coiled onto his arm like that and become fixed fast. <clears throat> bitten in and his poison was seeping into him. Caradog panicked. He ran out into the, um, into the city walls, but none of the guards could prise the thing off his arm. He began to lose his wits. The venom was acting on him and he began to lose his strength. He wasn't thinking clearly and in a kind of mad frenzy, he ran outside the city walls into the marshlands south of Sirencester in the uh, basin of the River Thames. That's where I am now, by the way, and all of the land and fields around me are very, very, very marshy, uh, a lot of willow growing, and lots of tributaries that go and form the Great River Thames that east of here flows through London. But here, it's marshland. It's marshland now, it's marshland then. Wilderness. And into this wilderness, Caradog committed himself. He was ashamed of the black snake on his arm. He did not think his beloved wife Tegau would love him with this affliction. Poor silly fool, my friends. I'm sure we've all been there. When was the last time you tried to hide the black snake coiled round your arm? Best keep it hidden, no? We all do this day in, day out. Year after year, we hide our serpents from our loved ones. But perhaps there's no need, as this story tells us. Anyway, Tegal, she returned from her visit from her brother and found the royal palace of Corinium empty. She couldn't find her beloved husband. None of the guards knew what had happened either. She searched and searched and searched. She sent soldiers out to comb the marshes, but her husband was nowhere to be seen. Meanwhile, Caradog had been taken in by a hermit who lived alone on a little island in the middle of a marshy swamp in a little sort of cell, maybe made out of little bricks of ruined clay and all grown over with willow and moss and vegetation so it could scarcely be seen. And Caradog spilled his whole sorry story to this wise old hermit. There's quite often a hermit in these stories. They're a kind of linchpin, a turning point in the story. And that hermit just listened, listened like wise old hermits do, and tended to Caradog best he could. But days turned to weeks, turned to months, turned to years. Two years, Caradog had that serpent wrapped round his arm, and he grew weaker and weaker and weaker and the serpent grew more and more bloated until Caradog was just a frail wraith of a man. In desperation, Tegau went to visit her brother, Drion, who lived beneath the mound in the fairy world. Uh, if anyone could find her lost husband, it was her own brother. So Drion took to the hunt as well. He turned himself into a, a, a kite, a red kite, and scoured the marshes with his raptor eyes. Or sometimes he would become a waterfowl, a duck, or a moorhen, or a swan, making his way through the riverways and channels and marshes. Other times he would become a breeze or a blade of grass and listen. And eventually he saw, in the very heart of the swamp, 
a hermit drawing up water. Ah, that's my guy, thought Dreon. So, he followed this hermit back to a hidden cell, and there, sure enough, he found his brother-in-law, Caradoc. Caradoc said, please, please don't let my wife see me like this. And uh, uh, Drion, he just shook some sense into his brother-in-law and said, she loves you. She loves you regardless of whether you've got a sodding snake on your arm, hello metaphor, or not. Uh, she loves you for you. She loves you unconditionally. Now, tell me how this happened. Caradog unveiled the whole story. He said everything about his mother, about the snake, about the conversation with his father. And, Dr and Drion said, ah, so. I know where to go now, back to the root of this matter. So he went back to Sirencester, back to the uh, tower where, uh, where Caradog's mother was imprisoned. And he couldn't get past the guards, of course. He was just a kind of strange fairy from another world. So he turned himself into a little sparrow and flew through that same windows and found Caradog's mother, the Queen of Gwent, in serious conversation with a crow. And that crow then changed back into human form. It was that druid Elviras. And then Drion the sparrow turned into his humanoid form. And the two men looked at each other. Ah, they had the measure of each other very well here. A wizard and a fairy eyeballing each other, both knowing that they both possessed magical powers. Drion came right out with it. He said to Elviras, what will it take? The old Roman road to Sirencester has now been bisected by a train line, so that's what you might have just heard there. Drion said to Elviras, the dark druid, what will it take to free your son of his curse? Elviras said, it is simple. Give us your word and the word of Caradog that my lover and his mother shall be free of this tower. It is done, said Drion. Then I will tell you how to free Caradog of the serpent on his arm. But it will be hard. It will take the love and sacrifice of someone who loves him more than they love their own self. My sister, my sister is one such woman, said Drion. Tell me what I need to do. And the druid told him. So, Drion went and uh, fetched up his sister, and the two of them journeyed into the swamps south of Sirencester to find uh, the hermitage and her husband. And eventually they found them. And when, uh, when Caradog heard that his wife has come, he tried to run, he tried to hide, and she had to go and find him, hold him by the face, and say, I love you, nothing will change that. And he was all like, ah like a wizened little golem of a king now. Now what they had to do is a very old piece of ritual magic and we see echoes of this in lots of bits of folklore all over Europe and it was this. They had two uh, vats, two barrels or tubs or bathtubs if you like. One they filled with vinegar and the other one, uh, two swords lengths apart, they filled with warm milk and honey. Now, Caradog, with the bloated serpent on his arm, was to get into the vat of vinegar and just let it all seep into his cuts and pores and cause him a bit of pain, whereas Tegau was to fit her beautiful, ripe body into the vat of warm milk. And then she rested her breast, her naked breast, just on the rim of that tub, of that bath. And then she spoke cooing, loving words to that serpent, saying, that emaciated man can give you no nourishment anymore. Come, suckle on my breast instead. And that serpent, who was starting to kind of suck the vinegar through its fangs, suddenly eyeballed her lovely breast and quick as a flash unloosed itself from his arm and went ah towards the breast of Tegau but her brother was there with a sword quick as a flash and cut off its head but 
he wasn't quite quick enough because that serpent had just fastened itself onto her breast and he sliced off his own sister's nipple. Bit of a strange detail, but she indeed had to sacrifice a piece of her precious, perfect body to save the life of her beloved. And she did it willingly. Well, as the story goes, Caradog and Kegau were very much reunited in love and he was overjoyed and gradually when his wits returned it was like becoming human again and gradually his strength came back it took many 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 months but with a, a good training regime and a lot of you know physiotherapy and pilates and yoga and all that uh, he gradually became even stronger than before so in the Welsh legends he's sometimes called uh, Caradog of the strong arm and he went back to the city of Corinium where he was king he of course released his mother who disappeared into the forest with a dark druid <laughs> never to be seen again until later in this story now Caradog proved to be a great great ruler and was indeed a bulwark against the Saxon invaders for a time and his wife loved him very very much now after some time Caradog got news that his foster father the king of Gwent in Wales was on death's door so he rode to meet him and he also related the whole story about his mother and it seemed that the story gave some peace some satisfaction to the old man as he lay dying and die he did and Caradog inherited all the lands of Gwent as well as the lands of Sirencester. Who came to meet him and congratulate him? None other than King Arthur and his court who always wings himself into these stories at various moments. King Arthur congratulated um, Caradog and insisted that he accompany him back home to Sirencester. So they were going through the forest of Dean when, of course, a deer burst from the thicket. Just like so many of these old Celtic stories, a deer burst from the thicket and Caradog and King Arthur himself set into hot pursuit. But then winds and rains, a storm suddenly descended, lightning was striking the trees and Caradog became separated from the rest of Arthur's retinue and he was riding through. The deer had fucked off, uh, nowhere to be seen. He could barely see the wood from the trees. But there, deep in the forest before him, there was a bubble of sunlight right in the middle of this stormy tempest and he rode towards that uh, glade of sunshine and that glade of sunshine was moving through the forest and at the center of the glade of sunshine there was a figure in a green cloak on horseback and he rode up and then he was riding with that figure in green on horseback and he realized that all of the uh, surrounding forest was was just beautiful and sunlit as long as he was riding next to this figure in green and he went deeper and deeper into the forest and found a glade of pure summer he never would have found on his own it was like he had stepped into the other world because in a way perhaps he had this figure in green showed him to a little quaint log cabin and he opened the door and there was a little fire crackling in the hearth there was a nice pot of stew bobbling away on the fire and some mead was served to him by a pleasant young woman and that figure in green took off his hood it was his own father as he probably guessed the druid Elviras a little greyer in beard and then who should come through the door but his own mother, her face radiant in contentment. And he stayed with them for a little while, sharing tales. She gave him the love she never truly gave him as a child. And such sweet words were passed between them. It was like they were a family, like they had never really been before. But still, there was a little bit of darkness inside Caradog because he knew what his mum had done to him with the serpent and that his beloved wife still bore the scar on her breast. Now Elviras being a druid <laughs> he sensed something was up he read his own son's thoughts and presented him with a coin on the day of his departure. 
It was a magic coin. It had been taken from an old shield boss of one of the old Celtic heroes of days gone by. And he said that it would mould itself to any wound. Place it on your wife's bosom. <laughs> he made sure that his son understood. And then Caradog bid farewell to his mother and father for the last time. They were safe in their garden of contentment and there they remain to this day. Story's not over though, because Caradog rode back to Sirencester and Tegau said, where have you been? Because of course, a lot more time had passed in the world outside this uh, other world than, um, than outside it. Where have you been, my beloved, Tegau said. I thought for all the world that I had lost you again. And he embraced his wife and said, there was something I needed to do. Never again, never again, never again will I leave your side. And that night, in the quiet sanctity of their bedchamber, he placed a golden coin on Tegau's scarred breast. And it turned itself into a golden nipple. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why, to this day, Tegau is called Tegau of the Golden Breast. And she appears in all sorts of tales. <laughs> so this is a lesser known story from the uh, annals of Arthurian legend, which is based on Celtic folklore. And this particular story takes place right here. So, uh, a nice way to connect this local area where I live to the magical history of our ancestors. Um, another little epilogue to this story, Caradog was a historical king. He was the last defender of uh, the Romano-British capital of Carinium. So this myth, this legend, has some uh, brushing up with actual history, you know, a piece of which I'm holding in my hand. Uh, it's this. King Arthur and his retinue did not ultimately win the battle for Britain. The Saxons won, which is why I'm speaking English to you now and not Welsh, obviously. Sirencester, uh withheld the Saxon invaders for a long time, but eventually it fell. It fell for this reason. The Saxons couldn't breach the city walls of uh, Sirencester, the very walls in which Caradog's mother was imprisoned. Uh, but they noticed that sparrows would nest in the roofs of the buildings of Sirencester, giving it the name colloquially Sparrow City. So what they did, they waited till those sparrows were in all the fields outside Sirencester, like where I am now, and they tied burning wicks to their tails and waited till they went home to roost and they burned the city to the ground. And then they took over the ruins. And from those ruins grew the pleasant Cotswold town of Sirencester as it is today. So my friends, that was the first time I've told this story, so thank you for listening. Uh, and nice to tell a piece of local folklore from the area where I grew up. Maybe I'll do a little more of that. And if you enjoy um, stories and folklore and myth from our Celtic past, as well as a bit of um, Germanic and Norse stuff, uh, and stuff from the European tradition, then why not give me a like and a subscribe? That would mean a lot. Or why not follow me on Patreon? I'll leave some details below. Thank you very much, my friends, for watching. And um, if you're ever in the area of Southwest England, then uh, come visit Brandeers. We have a historic site here. Thank you very much. Uh, final little epilogue here. Um, you can see behind me the rather unattractive archaeological infrastructure, but right here is a second century Roman kiln that, as I said at the beginning of the video, would have fired all of the bricks and tiles that would have built um, the city of Corinium, which I talked about in this story. So we right here are connected to this myth. Um, one final way in which history and myth sometimes intersects. In some versions of this story, uh, Tegau, she has, um, it's not a drinking horn 
that shows the faithfulness or unfaithfulness of um, the wives of the drinker. It's actually a, a golden cape. Tego has a golden cape, so her breast is gold because she has a gold cape. And um, if any woman wears this, if she's faithful, the cape stretches down to her feet. And if she's unfaithful, it only stretches about as far as her lap. Now, a golden cape has actually been found in the archeological record from the Bronze Age. Uh, there's nothing really linking it to this story apart from the imagery because it is just a breast cape made of gold, which is just interestingly similar to the mythos of Tegau, of the golden breast. So possibly you could suggest maybe even a Bronze Age origin to the uh, very earliest nugget of this myth because that's how myths work. They kind of evolve over time, moving into the Iron Age, into the Romano-British time, into the Dark Ages, into the courtly romance period of the Middle Ages, and even into the 19th and 20th century, 21st century. We're still reimagining these stories because they, of course, live inside of us. Anyway, enough waffle from me. Thanks for listening and watching, and I'll see you next time.